the youngest person that I knew was 14 years old and he had a 60 year sentence for breaking in a house. What? So. Wow. I mentioned that primarily because it was being around other people younger than me with life sentences that helped me understand this is not what I want. These people are never going home ever. Wow. Yeah, at 14, there were 15, I mean, yeah. 14, 15, 16, 17, life sentence, 40 years, life without parole, 60 years, 70 years, 99 years, on and on and on and on. Some for murder, some for possession. No! Don't be sitting down, king without a crown. No time for hesitation. If I slip, I won't rebound. Look at life and notice I control my own fate. Disappointment stumbles in. How much can my soul take? But I'm doing this for more than me. Live my life accordingly. Know the bigger picture is depicted through the worth I bring. Back to my people, post a challenge, we can make it. Prefer a dream catching over all the dream chasing. That mean I believe I was born to achieve. Welcome to the Ideas for the Open-Minded TCAST. Here, we explore social issues with unique people and perspectives through productive conversation while purposefully excluding politicism to promote good standalone ideas. Our guests and our listeners are people with open minds and open ears who seek to learn from others so that we can make this world a better place. So let's do this. My special guest today is entrepreneur Byron Kennedy. Byron's the president and founder of Brinco USA, a print and promotional merchandising firm that helps business owners and marketing executives source company apparel, swag, and print products. He's also a father of two young children and a husband to a wonderful wife whom he credits for his patience and sense of humor. Humbled by some poor decisions he made at an early age, he's now devoted to nonprofits who provide mentoring and educational resources to low-income families. I encourage you to listen to this intriguing story in total of how a black man in America turned a potentially life-ending experience into one of success and happiness despite roadblocks. Perhaps we can unlock some secrets to beating racial and economic odds with others and gain new perspectives on how we view someone with a felonious past and respect that under the right circumstances, humans can bounce back. We now join our convo after I ask Byron to share a little bit about his upbringing. All right, so... I'm from South Dallas. I'm from a little area called Rhodes Terrace. You know, growing up there was, it was what it was for us. You know, it it was something that we were, that we were used to. So the neighborhood itself, it was a low income housing. And that's uh, primarily everyone who lived in the neighborhood fit within that description, if you will, low income. My grandmother lived there more than 20 years. And I don't know that I've ever known my grandmother to have had a job. She was always either on food stamps or some type of disability, primarily because she was diagnosed with lupus when I was very, very young. And as a result of that diagnosis, I lived a large percentage of my life with my grandmother, along with an aunt and an uncle, both of them pretty young. My aunt's five years older than me. My uncle is eight years older than I am. So we kind of all grew up together. Almost peers almost at that at that yeah. age, right? Yeah, 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 pretty much. But because I was the youngest person in the house, my grandmother's primary concern in a lot of ways was ensuring that I had all of the things that I need. So my grandmother, again, she 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 stayed in this neighborhood most of 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 my childhood. I mean, even when when I was going to junior high school, I went to a, a junior high school called uh, the Dallas Environmental Science Academy. This school is in West Dallas. So my grades were good enough in elementary school that you had to go through the whole process of applying to the school to be accepted. It was a, a magnet school within DISD. So I, I went there in my seventh and eighth grade years. And, and during this time, I lived with my grandmother the entire time. And, and my mom and my stepdad took care of my younger brother and sister, but they lived separately than I did with my grandmother. And I'd still see them on the weekend, spend my summer with my mom and stepdad versus <laughs> my grandmother. It was kind of the, the the opposite, if you will. You know, typically you, you, you're home during the school year with mom and dad, and then the summer or a portion of the summer you spend with your grandparents or other members of the family. 
But for me, for me, it was the opposite. And again, primarily it was because my grandmother was sick. But as far as uh, getting around each day, she was able to do that, able to cook meals for herself and I, able to go grocery shopping the first of the month, all of those things she was able to do. But being able to do some things for long periods of time is really where the challenge was more often than not. But after my junior high years, you know, I went to a school in Dallas called uh, Skyline High School, and I was living at this point in my life, I was back home with my mom, my stepdad, my brother, and my sister, because my grandmother had reached a point in her life and with her sickness that she needed a little bit more care than I could give. So her kids and the family made the decision to move her to the same part of town that everyone else was living in. And this was a part of Dallas called Pleasant Grove, really far East Dallas. So she moved into an apartment complex along with one of my aunts, and lived there for a number of years. And uh, eventually she passed away in 2002. And here's the irony in that. So my birthday is January 21st. Her time of death is 1243, January 22nd, and that's 1243 a.m. And the story goes, she waited long enough to not ruin my birthday. (laughs) Oh, my. Oh, my. I hope she did. Right, that's funny. Oh, wow. (laughs) Things were still kosher at that point going into high school. Your grades were still good and all that. Or? You know what? Well, Skyline was also a magnet school. And and part of the reason I wanted to go to Skyline was because I wanted to be a part of their diesel mechanic program. So my grades were good enough to be accepted into that program because the way the Dallas school district worked at the time is if you didn't live in a certain disco, uh, zip code, I'm sorry. You couldn't go to a certain school. You could only go to the school that was within your zip code or closest to your home. So because Skyline was so far away from where my parents lived, I had to apply to be accepted for that reason, but also because I wanted to be in this particular program. Now, Skyline also had a a public school component that was without these particular career development programs, as they were described then. So, yeah, my grades were still good enough at that time to be accepted into Skyline. And I stayed there my freshman year. It's freshman year in high school that things kind of started to turn for me. And and the irony is it's also the time that at the same time or during these years that my grandmother was sick and I was back home with my mom and stepdad versus with my grandmother, which is something I was really used to. Right. While she's struggling, you weren't there, right? No, I, I wasn't. Her her care became the responsibility of my aunt, who lived a quarter mile up the road from her. So my sophomore year in high school, because my grades weren't good enough, I was kicked out of the diesel mechanic program and had to go to public school. So I went to public school for a year, got my grades turned around because I wanted to go back to Skyline, reapplied, and got accepted again. So this time around, instead of getting in the diesel mechanic program, I got into the graphic design program. And there we created everything that the school used for its day-to-day operations, whether it was attendance sheets, applications for future students to enroll, referrals, uh, any type of paperwork used within the school, we created there and designed there in the graphic design program. We also developed film. You know, this was in in 2001, late 2001, early 2002, and, and there we're developing film, you know, under red lights. It, like, it, it was really cool, but in the dark room. But it was also my junior year that I committed an aggravated robbery and went to prison shortly thereafter. Okay. So forgive me for slowing you down there, but that's a big leap, right? So, (laughs) so you're, you're a scholar, you're hitting, you're hitting some schools that are providing some, I would consider better benefit than perhaps the neighborhood would have provided across the street from where you were growing up. Right. Certainly. Uh, The schools in the neighborhood I was growing up in were uh, Pearl C. Anderson, which is a junior high school in South Dallas, and Lincoln High School, which is, in a lot of ways, the premier high school 
of South Dallas. Okay. So you were seeing some success. You had you were maintaining your grades and you had a familial structure that was at least stable, whether you're moving back and forth or not. You only moved like the one significant move, right? So right. was there there's something that I'm missing that kind of triggered the type of behavior or any kind of or and even if you know, I mean, sometimes oh, kids yeah. do stupid stuff and they don't even know why they did it. But I'm curious what well, how did you get talked into or decide to make a decision like that? Well, there there are um, a sequence of events that that really happened during the summer heading into my junior year of high school. I really wasn't a big fan of living with my mom and her stepdad. And part of that is because from my point of view at the time, I was the last priority in the house. And 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 whether that's a the right way or wrong way to look at it, it was my viewpoint. And I felt like I shouldn't be. I may be the newest member in the house in a lot of ways, but I was I am my mom's oldest son, oldest child. So and while my stepdad is the only dad I know. There's not very many stories I can pull on where there was a sit down between he and I and some guidance offered. But whether that's relevant or not, I didn't really like the way I fit into in, into something that was already established. Right. Was there anything that played into? Because uh, you have other siblings, right, that live with her. Or I not? do. So I have a younger brother and a younger sister. So the circumstances, I mean, whether those were, again, justified or not, and I'm not trying to get too deep, but just trying to summarize perhaps how you're feeling is that you felt like your siblings were living with your mom and you were living with your grandmother, and then you returned to your mom. So you felt like kind of the third wheel, even though you should have been first in line in most other scenarios, right? Well, true to the first part of that question, yes, I felt like a third wheel. I'm not so sure I should have been first in line, but I should have received equal consideration. And again, that that's not something I felt I received. And some examples of that include getting new school clothes or receiving the type of financial help that would be needed to participate in sports or even having a one parent or the other show up at a sporting event. And, and again, maybe that's a perfect world, but those are things that I expected because I recognized that there was an opportunity for those things to happen. So if, if there is a, a basketball game, you aren't doing anything today, you can come if you like, but I don't feel like it, it was typically the answer. And, and, and also keep this in mind, these are things that, that I really came to recognize in my adult years, having the opportunity to sit back and and think on them and try to understand why some things may have happened the way they did. But I also recognize that I come I come from, and this included my grandmother, you know, along with my mom and other members of my family, but I come from a household where the answer is because I said so. And I've decided to raise my kids a little bit different and offer them answers to the question why. Versus giving them the because I said so answer because I didn't benefit from that. Sure. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. I and mean, it sounds like maybe you kind of felt like the step kid all along. You know, a lot of kids have, you know, split split homes and they have a parent in each scenario. And in this particular case, the way it was set up for you, it kind of felt like you were the step kid no matter where you went, right? I, I certainly felt that way. Not not so much with my grandmother, but definitely with what came to be home. Yeah. And so without particular guidance and, you know, obviously I understand why a lot of stuff wouldn't come to realization until you're older because kids don't have any life context. They don't they don't know how to, it's like, right. you know, here's the value of money. It's kind of impossible to do until you're old enough to work. And, you know, here's what falling in love is when, you know, a kid has no clue. So I completely right, right, sympathize right. with that. I, and I and I can re totally relate to that as well. So where did a lot of your influence come from since you didn't have specific direction to parental direction at that point? And is that part of this pivotal moment? I'm just trying to kind of dig enough it, to it, figure it, out. It, it is. You know, the direction came from nowhere and everywhere. And in hindsight, it's it's all of the information that I would take in from either 
people I hung with at school or things that I saw on TV or things that I listened to on the radio, you know, those were the things I saw. Those were the things I wanted more so because I didn't have anybody else to give them to me. There was nobody I could go to and say, Hey, I want this, you know, can you buy this for me? Or what do I have to do to, to get this, you know, no, what do I have to do to, to, to get this as a reward? So anyway, it, it turned into me finding a way to, in my mind, get all of the things that I need to, so that I can be independent, so that I can live on my own and do my own thing and make my own decisions and, and really kind of exist independent of the structure that I was in. And, and all of this while I'm in high school, literally trying to graduate. So it's funny. During the summer that I mentioned before, my sophomore year going into my junior year, because I didn't like the environment that I was in, because I didn't like being at home, I left and I uh, I called my uncle. And this is my mom's brother, also my grandmother's son. Okay. I gave him a call and I let him know how I was feeling and asked him if he had a place or if I could come and stay with him for a little while until I figured things out. And he told me, yeah, you can you can come and stay here. So I let my mom know that this isn't working for me. So I'm going to take my things and I'm going to go live with my uncle. So that wasn't received very well, but the decision was what the decision was. And, and, and that's what I ended up doing. So living with my uncle, I was able to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it, how I wanted to do it. There were no rules. There were no other kids there. It was he and his wife and I. So I was able, yeah, I was able to do all of the things that I wanted to do there. If I wanted to drink, I could drink. If I wanted to smoke, I could smoke. No matter what it is I wanted to do, there, there were really no, no real rules. So I lived there and continued to go to school. I was responsible for getting myself to school, and I continued to go. But also in the process of needing to make money so that I can get out of my uncle's house, I started selling weed. And that's the first bad decision that I made. So like. So among all of them. Okay. So, and you know who you're talking to, so I get it. But for somebody that's hearing this for the first time, help us understand how you go from just being a student that's allowed to do whatever to deciding to sell weed. Like how does that decision come about? Is it just as simple as, Hey man, this friend of mine said, I'm doing this and I'm making the, and I'm making bank and here's a good opportunity or how, how that come about? Well, in a lot of ways, that's it. You know, you 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 see it, you're around it. And again, growing up in the neighborhood that I grew up in, that that's I mean, that that's all that's there. You become a student of these things, whether you want to or not, because it's the knowledge that you're intaking. Like that's what you see. That's all that's there. It's your environment. It, it's it's your environment. So that thought was an easy one because that's easy. <laughs> you, you know, or, or at least at the time, that's the thought process. That's easy. I, I can do that. So you know who to, you basically you're saying you already knew who to hit up if you wanted to get in the game. You just hit them up and say, of course, I want to get, you know, get some from him yeah, and then you course. just resell it and you're off to the races. Right. Okay. Right. So that didn't last long. I went to school with pot on me and got caught with it. So I ended up going to a, uh, what they call a, uh, I forget what they call it. Uh, a school or something, alternative something. It's like an alternative school. Yeah. So I ended up going here for a little while. That wasn't working for me either. So again, I still need money. I still need to leave my uncle's house so that I can go and do all of the things that I need to do. I need an apartment. I need my own transportation. I need all of the things that I need because in, in my mind, it's time for me to do my own thing. So. I was sitting at school one day because, mind you, I'm still going to school. And within the school, there is a an area in the school called the Student Center. And in the Student Center is typically where all of the upperclassmen congregate, meet in the morning, hang out, kind of prepare for the day. And, and when I say upperclassmen, this is only kids in, that are juniors and seniors. Within this um, student center, there is a student store, and the store is owned and operated by a, an independent contractor. But I'm sitting in the student center one day, and I see the guy preparing to go to the bank. You know, he has his money bag, bank bag, all of that. And I see all of this, and I make a decision right then that I need that bag. 
And that decision right there, right then. A crime of crime of opportunity, almost like you hadn't even been thinking about it, but it, the hadn't opportunity even been thinking about it. It presented itself, never, and nope, okay. never committed a robbery before in my life. Never done. I've sold weed. That's what I've done. So I decide right then. You know what? That's going to help me accomplish the things that I'm aiming to accomplish. That's going to help me get an apartment. That's going to help me get transportation. That's going to help me get off and away from where I am now. So obviously as a kid, and, and again, I can completely relate uh, being a kid and completely ignoring the consequences, but with this occurring so instantaneously for you, when you look back, do you think that there was any consideration for what could possibly happen? I mean, you're, you're hitting somebody up in your own school. It's not like you're not going to come back the next day or whatever. So in my mind, nobody's going to know, right? No, nobody's going to know. Like, I'm the only person who knows. Nobody knows but me. So, you know, even looking back on it now, there was never any consideration for any consequence ever. There was never consideration for you're going to get arrested. There was never consideration for, you know, this is how it's going to impact your future. There was never any consideration for the person you're committing the crime against, the victim. There was never any consideration of, of any of these things. There was never any consideration of how this is going to impact your family, how your friends are going to feel about you, all of the people who know, like, never any consideration for any of that. The only thing that I could think of at the time is that's what I need. Okay. So play it out for me. How, how did you end up doing it? Like, what, what kind of uh, action did you take? I mean, you saw it happening. You were, I guess, the, you, know, you were the only one in proximity. Nobody else was around, I guess. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. There, there were more than a handful of students around. but and, and there may have been multiple people who who saw the same thing that I saw. But I was certainly the only one who had the thought that I had. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> right. So maybe two weeks go by and I'm aiming to build up the courage to do this. So a couple of weeks go by and, you know, it, it's the same thing every day, every morning. Same thing, same process. And one morning. Or, or, or the guy always left, you know, once he, I assumed he always walked to his car every time he counted money so that he could go to the bank. And the morning that I committed the robbery is the first morning that I'd ever followed him. And even that itself was an opportunity. It's also the first day that I had a gun with me. So... This is at school during school hours or before school? This is this is at school before school. Okay. He leaves out of the building. I leave behind him. We're both alone in a, a courtyard outside of the school. I pull a gun out and I tell him to give me the bag. He gave me the bag. I ran off. It was that fast? That fast. No conversation. No nothing. And I was arrested the same day. Because he knew you, right? I mean, he pretty much knew who you were. Yeah. And and maybe I left out the part of about putting a bandana around my face. But even with the bandana around my face, I was arrested the same day. Okay. And was it also just as easy to get a gun as it was to decide to be a weed dealer? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, getting, I, getting a gun is an easy process. Yeah. If 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 you want a gun. Yeah. And And again, if you come from, yeah, I don't think it even matters where you come from. Getting a gun is as easy as you as you want it to be. Yeah, I would agree with that. I was just making sure I'm not making any supposition along the the, the storyline. So, so you you took a, over the course of a week and a half or so, just kind of thinking about getting it done. You didn't tell a soul about it. This was completely just something that you had on your own mind and just thought this was going to make you independent and get you yeah. on. So even when you had time, in other words, to think about consequences. As a youngster at that age, with that environment, without really a level way of looking at or having been mentored on accountability or anything, you really just had there was a one sided decision facing you, essentially. Right. right? There, I, I don't even understand the concept of prison at this time. I don't understand the idea. Yeah. Like, I mean, how old are it, you? It, it doesn't, it, I, I'm 16 at this time. OK, yeah, of course there's not. Yeah. So, so there's a. Um, this doesn't exist in my world and, and, and it probably, and, and it does exist more in hindsight than I recognize then. But for me, it doesn't exist. It's not an option. It's not a consequence I recognize, but, um, 
I was arrested the same day and I played football at the time. And I happened to be, I still remember this clear as day. <laughs> I happened to be in my Spanish class. My Spanish teacher was also my position coach. I played cornerback on varsity football. And in the Spanish class, I happened to be asleep at the time, <laughs> head on the desk, asleep. And I woke up to the police standing over me. So, yeah. And they didn't arrest me in class, but they definitely escorted me out of class. Was that a peaceful process or had that work in terms of from your perspective? Yeah, it was. Yeah, okay. it was. I, um, I, I went along with them. Um, once I got to, I forget what it's called. I'll call, I'll simply call it the law enforcement office uh, of the school. But once I got there, they pretty much let me know what's what, what they knew. I was arrested at school. I went to, they took me to the uh, Dallas police station and all in the same day, man. I, yeah, yeah, this is, this is, this, you, you, you can't, you can't deny this. You you know what I mean? This is reality hitting you in the face with a shovel. This is reality hitting you in the face, man. This is, this is the real deal. So, so did they, they didn't take you to juvenile at that point as a 16 year old, they took you straight to County. They take me straight to County. Okay. So, um, well, well, wait a minute. Let, let me say this. So, yeah, let me backtrack a little bit. I'm 16 at the time. I have this idea. Okay, so check this out. So, I committed this crime February, February 4th, 2002. So, I say about a week and a half. That's how much time passed between my 17th birthday and me committing this crime. January 21st to February 4th. That's just That's just proof that you didn't think ahead. Right. I mean, right. Right. Go. So that's how much time passed. I, and, and it's funny that question brought that back to mind that this was around my 17th birthday. So a couple of weeks after I turned 17, I committed this crime. And yes, I went to count. So from that process on, I, I'm, I'm not going to harp on this because you have a lot more, a lot more of your story to tell. But was there anything significant about the process whether that be the prosecutory process or, you know, your attorney being helpful or not helpful or, you know, the way the prosecutor treated you. Was there was there any grace at all? Was there any uh, did you cooperate? I mean, how did that whole process work? I know sometimes, you know, things can be really skewed and other times it is what it is. So I'm just curious how, yeah. how you felt about well, your. The, the one thing that I, I had a court appointed attorney and the one thing that that she made clear to me was the best thing that we have in this situation is the fact that you're a first time offender. So the DA at the time was offering me 30 years. So (laughs) that was obviously a non-starter. I can't, I can't just, um, you know, agree to voluntarily accept a 30 year sentence. Like, I don't know. We can't do that. So, my attorney and I ended up doing what we called or what Dallas called an open plea. And it's ultimately throwing yourself on the mercy of the court or the mercy of the judge. And the judge told me too, you know, you're young and I'm paraphrasing here, but you're young and people make mistakes. And as a result, I got an eight year sentence for a crime that carried a term of five to ninety nine. So even eight years at 17 was devastating, you know? It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. And and even then, you still don't really understand what's happening or what's about to happen, because this is, in a lot of ways, a step in the process that has been explained to you by all of the other inmates who are here, but have never experienced prison. So I, I was sentenced to eight years. Maybe a few months after that, I I was actually transferred to a TDCJ unit. Wow. So, all right. So your life took a took a complete U turn. And yeah, um, did you have any familial support at that point? The first year, yes, I had support. I would get money when there was money to send. I'd get visits when visits could be made. And keep in mind, when I eventually reached the unit that I was housed on, I was housed on Clemens Unit in Brazoria, Texas. Brazoria is maybe an hour and a half outside of Houston. It's in the Gulf. So 
I I did all of my time on one unit, fortunately. But during that first year, yeah, I I, I received uh, familial support and everything was fine. It was it was maybe going into the second year that that changed a little bit. So I or changed a lot really. So I spent the the next six and a half years really kind of existing in a world unto myself. Right. So you got your independence, but under circumstances you never fathomed, right? Exactly. So exactly. And and now you're you're getting to a point where you're interacting with people that are certainly older than you on average. I would assume there's probably a lot of youngsters there, but not as young as you, because you're an entry level age group. And now you're experiencing influence of people who have committed crimes of various types. How did you utilize your time? I'm I'm really curious as how does somebody was there ever an epiphany or a you know, did you leverage some of your uh, design skills or is there, is there any point which you were able to reflect and learn something positive or was it a negative experience that you were unable to, to really find any benefit from until you got out? Well, herein lies the irony in my prison experience. So I got there in 2002. I was 17 years old. I left in August of 2009 at 24 years old. And over the seven and a half years that I was incarcerated, there was never a doubt in my mind from beginning to end that I was never coming back. I was never going to go back. Like, I'll never do this again. I'll never, ever, 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 ever spend any more time here. And I kind of received opportunities early on that once again, I never really anticipated. And, and it's, it's even irony there to say, to mention the opportunity that I received in prison. But contrary to your earlier statement about me being the youngest person there, I actually wasn't. The special thing about Clemens Unit is it's a youth offender farm. So the youngest person that I knew was 14 years old, and he had a 60-year sentence for breaking in a house. What? So, wow. I mentioned that primarily because it was being around other people younger than me with life sentences that helped me understand this is not what I want. These people are never going home ever. Wow. Yeah. At 14, there were 15, I mean, yeah. 14, 15, 16, 17. Life sentence, 40 years, life without parole, 60 years, 70 years, 99 years, on and on and on and on. Some for murder, some for possession. Possession of controlled substances? Possession of a controlled substance, 40 years. And sometimes it's aggravated possession because they were also caught with a weapon. So the one thing about an an aggravated crime And the Texas penal code is you have to do 50% of that prison sentence before you're eligible to see parole. Eligibility doesn't mean release. Eligibility is simply review of behavior and time spent here, accomplishments or not while you're here. So in prison, I was able to accomplish quite a few things, uh, starting with Uh, my GED, and including things like Toastmasters, which is a public speaking program. It helps you develop uh, develop the ability to be able to speak fluently and convey thoughts in a concise way if you'd like. But more than anything, that helped me in so many ways. I I also had the opportunity to have a job assignment in the education department. So I was able to do all type of things that other people didn't have the ability to do. I was able to gain access to educators that other inmates didn't have the ability to do or take advantage of. So why is it that you had some of those opportunities when others did not? And what was kind of some of the distinguishing factors there? The the biggest and only distinguishing factor I can think of is 
one of the programs that this particular unit offered was a therapeutic community, and it was simply called the Youth Offender Therapeutic Community. And there, the entire program is based on accountability. It was in that program that I became aware of the harm that I caused. It's there that I became aware of the harm I caused to myself, first and foremost, to the victim of my crime, to my family, to everyone, everyone. So and in this not, program, that's not available. I'm sorry, that's not available to everyone, or is it voluntary? This isn't this isn't written policy in prison. This is just an opinion based on my experience. An inmate with a life sentence can't be rehabilitated. They can only be institutionalized. So no, a therapeutic community isn't available for someone who will probably never be released. So again, that's not written policy. That's opinion based on my experience. And that doesn't mean that doesn't mean they still, I mean, they're still alive, right? So right. And, and, and they can also self-rehabilitate. The opportunity is there. While you don't have certain rights in prison, the ability to educate yourself is there for the individual who chooses to take on that endeavor. But if you also choose to simply be here and exist day to day, then you, you won't benefit from the person who made the alternate decision. But yeah, I got my GED there. I, I got a couple trades there. Um, I became certified in a number of things there. You know, it, it was really just about taking advantage of everything that the prison did offer versus, you know, passing up on things because they didn't go far enough. So what do you think made you accept that epiphany and and create that determination? Is it just something inside of you in particular? Did you see other people that were like you? that maybe even had longer sentences, but that had such a untattered past before they committed a specific crime and that also had the same type of sentiment? Or did you run into a more people that just thought, I'm going to make the worst out of being bad while I'm here and you know run, run amok and cause more issues and become a better criminal, as people would say? For me, it was simple decision-making. The fact that I didn't have family support 90% of the time I was there, the fact that I wasn't a gang member, I was an individual. I was able to exist alone without influence from anyone on one side or another. I was able to determine for myself, these are the things that I want to do. These are the things that I want to prepare myself for. And when an opportunity comes, I'm going to be better off being prepared for it than not and seeing it pass me by. So it was simply all about doing everything that I could to prepare for any opportunity that presented itself for me. And, and some of the things that I considered was, you know, working offshore in oil and gas. So as a result, I became OSHA certified. Uh, other things included, again, going back into the, the print and design industry. That's an easy thing for me because it's what I've always done. So even if it was having to clean buildings, you know what? So be it. I, I got a janitor trade. If I had to go into the construction industry, so be it. I got a building trade. So again, all of these things that I had interest in, I gave it all the time that I had to give it until I accomplished a level of the program that was either graduating or, or up to the point I was released. Is there some kind of sign or trait that is distinguishable among other people in prison that you experience that, you know, when you tell your story, there's, there's a sympathetic aspect to your story, and there's also a, a year and a half where you completely turned around and all of a sudden you are thinking like a responsible adult and you figured it all out. Is there some kind of trait that you noticed in certain other people where it would be identifiable to someone else, whether it be a parole board or somebody else that could possibly show that kind of promise? I honestly think it was the ability to want more than what you had. The one thing that I understood is that I was going to be released one day. There was no doubt in my mind. I'm going to be released. 
I have a number of options, a number of options. One of those options, options being crime and making money in the streets versus behind a desk. The only thing that I really cared about for me, and I can't speak for, for what really motivates anyone else. The only thing that I can really identify for me was the burning desire to kill the naysayers. In prison, you know without a doubt that many of the people you leave behind have no doubt that you're going to get out and go back. Even the prison system tells you the same thing. You know, the years that I was in prison, the recidivism rate in Texas averaged 80%. Wow. Yeah. That means eight out of every 10 people who are leaving prison is going to come back. There's no way I'm going to be part of the 80 percent. Like, there's no way I'm going to be part of this. So, again, it became about equipping myself with all of the tools that I could think to equip myself with. So that I had a chance to be successful at something when I was able to be released. And. Even as much as I felt I prepared myself for any opportunity that I had, the one thing that I didn't prepare myself for was the day that I was actually released. I saw parole. I went before the parole board three times before I was actually released. And because I didn't really have any family support during the last six and a half years that I was incarcerated, I didn't have a home address to give the parole board the parole board or or an address that I could parole to. So I went the first year and I gave them the last address that I knew my mom to have. Well, I was denied and given what they call a one year set off. So you can come back in another year and we'll review you again. Well, the next year I went to the parole hearing, but I had the same address that I had before. I don't really have any new information to give. And that's essentially what was keeping you from. I can't I can't say that. I can't say that Um, the parole board really don't give you a reason. They just give you an outcome based on our review. The decision is another review on this day. And 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 in a lot of ways, that's really all you get. So the third time that I was scheduled to see parole, I didn't even go to the hearing. You know what? I'm not even going to go because this is a waste of my time. And at this time, I'm six and a half years in. I've decided I'm just going to do all of it. That way, I don't have to be on parole when I get out. I don't have anybody to report to. I can just focus on what I'm aiming to accomplish and I can hit the ground running. So I'm just going to do all of it. I'm going to be released February 4th, 2010. Like, I know that's my release date. You can't keep me a day past that. August 9th, 2009 is when I was released. And this was on a Monday. On Thursday of the previous week, an officer came to my bunk and let me know that I was being shipped off of the unit I was on and that I was going to Huntsville. And once I got to Huntsville, on that Monday when I was released, it was then that I realized I was being released to the Fort Worth Transitional Facility on Henderson Street, downtown Fort Worth. Okay. The first time in my life I've ever been in Fort Worth. Interesting. And I've been here ever since. And very interesting. Wow. So, I mean, that's why your story is so unique. It's it's I told you when, you know, when we greeted one another that I that I may pry, but it's it's so fascinating and intriguing to figure out if there's a switch that we can flip and other people. Obviously, you had your own switch and you just said, wow, I just had my wake up call and you were done. Yeah. And And it was it it was it was that simple. I'm done with this. I'm never going to do this again. Like, I'm never doing this again. They're like, I'm never doing this again. And that's all I could ever think about. So before before we progress into the the glorious days, did you see any kind of, you know, with, with especially with the youngsters that had these super long sentences, did you see any racial disparities or anything in those? Were there, were there anything that was disturbing other than the fact that it's disturbing by itself, the fact that a 14-year-old's going to do 60 years? Were there any other factors that played a, a role in, in what you observed or how you felt? Well, I, I can tell you this. Um, the racial breakdown 
or percentage of those incarcerated in the Clemens unit. And I'll stick to that because that's my experience. I mean, in every dorm I lived in and every cell block I lived on, Black and Hispanics are eight to one or or eight to two. And, and, and it's, I mean, that that's who's there. <laughs> you know, like, like that's who's there. If, if you take, if you take a, a, a day room in prison and you divide it, you're going to divide it three ways. You're going to divide it the black side, the Hispanic side or the Latino side. And then way in the back in a little sliver of space, you got your white guys. And there's maybe four or five out of 50. Well, wow, so you know? that, that disparity was even even magnified where you were. So it's even it's even oh, no, worse no doubt about than it. some of the stats that we see these days. No doubt about it. Yes. No, horrible. no doubt about it. That's horrible. It is. But but again, you it's 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 all that exists. And and, and when you're there, you don't notice it because you're in it. And these are the people that you're around. You know, it's not until you have the opportunity, and that's if you have the opportunity, to step away from it and and see it from the outside to recognize that there is a wow factor here. No question. That's a wow factor. Eight to one is yeah. insane. That's a wow yeah, factor. It is. It is. Uh, compared to the percentage of the population, that's that's incredible. Yeah you being kind of an independent, quote unquote, independent, there's a lot of people that say, you know, hey, if you go to prison, then you've got to pick a gang and that's just the way things are. And there's there's no way to be an independent without getting bullied into a gang. Did you experience any of that? No, not at all. You know, the one thing about prison is there are definitely wolves and there are sheep. But somewhere in the middle, there are those that you simply respect who aren't going to be swayed and who you really can't find any conflict with. And I happen to be one of those guys. You know, I don't, I'm, I've always been in the middle of a debate and try to see both ways. Maybe not early on, but certainly, certainly these days. But, but again, though, I, I don't, I don't need to affiliate myself with a group in order to have an identity. I've never been that way. I've always been able to stand on my own and I've always been willing to walk away from relationships and situations that aren't healthy for me, especially once I decided that I wanted something better for at least my life. If it's not good for me, I don't want to be a part of it. And I don't care who you are. I don't really care what you think about it. It's simply not good for me. That's impressive. That's an impressive trait that you have, which leads to our, now that you're out and you're looking at the sunshine in a new way, you have this determination bone in your body. Now, obviously, you're a successful entrepreneur, you're a successful dad and husband. So tell me how you navigated that whole thing once you got out. It was really about setting goals. So one of the things I did when I got out, it was really about trying to find employment. So the first thing that I did is uh, newspapers were actually still around at this time. And the Fort Worth Star-Telegram and uh, a number of other, the Green Sheet and a, a number of other uh, periodicals were advertising jobs in the paper. So like everyone else I knew who needed a job, that's where we found opportunity. And I found a job with this printing and sales company. And I was given an opportunity there. And became pretty good at 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 sales, and this is all over the phone sales. But I had a, a a marginal amount of success, and ultimately grew into a manager with this company. And before long, had the ability to manage my own satellite office. So I was what they referred to as a facility director, and I had maybe twenty five to thirty employees at any one time that I was responsible for. So that was huge for me because it's the first significant accomplishment that I've had in my life. Yeah, that's awesome. To be honest, 
And it's also the first time ever in my life that I alone have been recognized for a job well done. That in and of itself became an addiction. Was the di- was it difficult to land that gig? Because I know a lot of times when you leave and you got a record, it becomes a lot more difficult to get a, a job. How'd more that easy about? than I ever thought it would be. I go into an interview. This Okay, this is what's funny. So during the time that I go into this interview, I, keep in mind, have not been in Fort Worth 60 days. I don't know the streets. I don't know the busing system. I, I know nothing. This is my first, this is the first time in my life I've ever been here. So I, I have this job interview scheduled and the job interview is off of Alta Mesa and McCart. Mind you, I'm coming from downtown Henderson Street, uh, the, the, the bus station off Jones. Going all the way it's raining town. outside. Yeah, it's raining outside. And the bus is a little late. So I end up walking into this interview maybe maybe three minutes late. And the guy who interviews is interviewing me also happens to have his regional director down from a corporate office who is evaluating him. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> so I walk in and he's like, well, buddy, you're late. <laughs> I'm like, man, please, please don't make me leave here without this interview. So we have a conversation and I explain to him, look, man, I don't know the same things I just explained to you. This is the first time I've ever been in for work. On the application, you clearly see that I have a felony. You still call me in for the interview, but I I need you to understand how one is kind of impacting the other. He was trying to hear none of it. It was his boss from the regional, I mean, from the Midwest, his regional director who told him, let's give this guy an interview. And they hired me the same day. Right on. Okay. Yeah, so so I was glad that worked out. I mean, because you know, as a business owner, you know how important punctuality is. Right. And without any context, it's easy to say, uh, thanks, guy, for coming in, but uh, we'll see you next time. Be on time next right. time, right? After time had passed, that training manager told me the reason they hired me was because if I fought like that for a job, I'd fight for a sale on the phone. There you go. Hey, good for you. That's true. He was not wrong. It's, hey, it's true. It's he was true. not wrong. But uh, but it, it is. It's it's funny in hindsight. But I eventually replaced that guy who hired me on my way to becoming facility director. So he was the training manager was the second in charge and worked under the facility director. So I replaced him and then ultimately replaced the the person who was running the office. That's phenomenal. And if that's not a success story enough, you took that and decided to jump off, walk off the plank with a blindfold again and say, you wanted to just start your own gig and be an entrepreneur. And how did, how did you find that inspiration? What led me to eventually walking away from this company is the last six months that I was there, I was training the grandson of the owner for a position that I myself wanted to entertain. Mm. So I didn't understand that if I was good enough to train your grandson, how I'm not good enough for the position. And that was enough for me. So I went to ownership and I let them know, you know, this isn't a a situation that's working for me anymore. I'm going to do my own thing. And um, it wasn't received well. It didn't go well early on. But six years later, things have turned around significantly. So you actually launched into an entrepreneurial endeavor almost at the hardest time ever because you were a fairly newlywed with a right. newborn. And yep. and you had a responsibility yep. to uh, feed my son mouth. was. Yeah, my my son was uh, two years old when I quit my job, and my daughter was four months. Is your wife working? My wife worked for me. (laughs) At the time? Yeah, she she actually, uh, she was one of my employees. She worked from home, though. So we worked for the same company. We were able to come up with an agreement with ownership that allowed her to work from home and allowed me to come into the office every day because we had young kids. Okay. 
So when you split off and did your thing, obviously, you know, when people ask me about, you know, how things are done, it's it's a very singular minded kind of endeavor where you just don't consider failure as as an option at all. So this kind of pressure, I can imagine, must have made you even more myopic and just going forward and and focused solely on success or bust because well, it did. So how did you transition into uh, building the company and and getting your wife uh, where she is now? Because she's working with you now, right? She is. We we um, we've been working together from the onset, and one of the things that we were really really confident about is our ability to do the job that we do. My wife has been in Fort Worth her entire life, and I was eventually shocked at the number of influential business owners. <laughs> that her and her family knows. <laughs> <laughs> so all of this time, she's been telling me, like, let's just do it. Like, it's going to be okay. Like, it's going to be good. It's going to be okay. And I'm like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know. Yeah, cut but, that um, cord. Cut the cord. Yeah. But, um, but eventually she was like, you know what? We really don't have a choice. If we don't do this, we're never going to be able to really give ourselves a chance at financial freedom. Like we're never going to be able to do it. We'll always have our pay dictated by this company or another company. So the day we left our job, the the day after we were approved or our LLC uh, application was approved and we set up our merchant account, we were accepting payments. We were getting orders. And, you know, in business, the best part is in a lot of ways that 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 first wave of clients, because it's all the people, you know, the hardest part is when you've already when everybody, you know, is a client, they're already a client. Like there's what, what you going to do now? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? Of course. So so that's when business truly got hard for us. And that's when we also got good at running our business because we had to figure it out. We had to really understand what it meant to market. We had to really understand what it meant to budget. We had to really understand what it meant to have a financial forecast. We had to really understand what it meant to surround ourselves with accountants and attorneys that could help us dictate policy. It was it, it turned around when you know we wanted to start adding people and hiring employees and giving people an opportunity to 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 represent our brand. So you know, training people, all of those things, you know, when, when we got serious about owning a business, things got really, really better for us. And not because we sold more, but because we were run and operating better. Right. You're honing your business savvy, essentially, right? Right. Were there any difficulties procuring any monies? Did you need money up front? And, and when you did your LLC, are you guys both members or? No, uh, I, I am the owner. Okay. Um, so we we are a single member LLC. I play that. Well, my wife allows me to have the title of president and CEO, and she's our executive vice president and CFO. So while while I own the business, no money gets spent unless she spends it. I, I completely sympathize with that as well. <laughs> Only I've I've even assigned ownership since then too, because it's just that way anyway. I get it. Yeah, and and I, I'm I'm sure I'm sure that conversation is is happening or. I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if paperwork has already been filed. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> trust me, it's okay. She's the one. You, you, look how much money you lost not listening to her in the beginning, anyway. Right? Exactly. So exactly, uh, she's exactly. proven she's proven that she's the one. So, oh, absolutely. Uh, did you run into any issues? Did you have to try to to procure any money up front? Sometimes people do, sometimes they don't. And I know sometimes race plays into difficulty in trying to get business loans, especially without experience and things like that. Did, did you run into any issues with that? You know, yes and no. So early on, we didn't really need any startup capital. We needed capital when we wanted to expand, when we wanted to bring on employees. We started our company initially from home. So we had the benefit of rent or mortgage, rent at the time being all we had to pay, yet we could still run our business. So we didn't have to worry about 
a commercial space. We didn't have to worry about, you know, Wi-Fi at a commercial space or all of the other costs associated with operating outside the home. So we, we tried to take advantage of that because it was easy to do so. And we had young kids. So at this time, we aren't really committed to the whole idea of daycare because my wife has been home and she's been able to balance this. And from her point of view, me being home also now really just makes it a little bit easier. And it did. So we didn't really need money until we got to the point where we were ready to expand. And it was at that point that trying to find a real loan or a term loan was was not even an option. Partially because or or the reason the most resounding reason to me is because we were a young business. So really, the only option that was available to us were merchant cash advances. And like a lot of small businesses, I have unfortunately had to have a merchant cash advance in the early years of our business. And while it's an expensive loan, it did what we needed it to do. And that was take care of payroll as we trained employees for sales. And and that was the trade off for us. If we can use this money for payroll or if we can use this money to train, as we would say, we'll get the salespeople we've hired to a point where we'll get a return and we can then obviously afford the loan. And it did happen that way. We just weren't profitable. It was a break even game. Sure. You know, every week we were trying. Yeah. It is transitional time. And you, you, you're obviously not going to be able to build the business with skilled and talented and smart people if they're not getting paid. And so, right. Totally, totally understand. We've all been in that situation where, you're facing growth, uh, but you still have to be p- pulling payroll in, and you've got all these net 60, net 90 right. clients right, that right, are right. eventually going to get to you that, uh, meanwhile, you're still you know, spending the cash. So I, I totally understand with that where, where you come with that. Yeah, So, um, but eventually, I, I don't really even, I, I can't really say or identify what turned things around. It just seemed to happen for us. And and when I say happen, I mean, the phone started ringing a little bit more. The email started to ding a little bit more. And and while, while I can't say, you know, our marketing efforts were the game changer, I mean, there is no doubt that, that it did give us a, a little bit more exposure. But even still, while the phone was ringing and the email was dinging, we were still breaking even, breaking even, breaking even, breaking even. Then we reached a point where three years in, four years in, we've got a little bit more experience now than we had before. We have access to a little bit more than we had before. And what we had access to was really software applications. And what happened is we had to decide if the software application accomplished the same thing that having a body in the seat did. We were also in a position where sales were declining. I don't know why sales were declining, but or I didn't know at the time, but it's the one thing that obviously we're trying to identify. Why are sales declining? Why are sales declining? And the one thing that we identified is we can't accommodate all of the clients that we have and clients who have committed to one product or another have backed out because of turnaround time. Well, turnaround time is affected by a number of other things. Sometimes you you really can't control. So what we did then was make a change. So we leased an additional office space where we could house printing equipment. And we changed our personnel. Instead of having more salespeople, we had more production people. The money that we invested in online marketing brought us sales. And the sales that it brought us, we were then able to feel faster because we increased our production capabilities. That's fantastic. It's genius. Yeah. So it worked itself out. But in the end, We lost more salespeople than we wanted to lose, but at the same time gained more production personnel than we thought we needed. But you're hanging on to all your clients who are essentially 
happy now that turnaround time is less of an issue and they're also a new referral base, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So yeah, you just right. and, and we do reconfigure we get tons your of whole thing. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, we, we get we get tons of referrals. We get we, you know, we that that's probably eighty percent of our business, referrals. Somebody who who was referred to us by a current client. And and that's I mean, I, I can't even I can't even really express the 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 level of appreciation we have for the clients that are willing to refer our services. There's there's no better way to hear great job. No, of course not. And that's just proof that it's a good job because somebody's willing to put their name on it to somebody else they trust. So there you go. Well, man, I'm I'm super stoked about this opportunity to chat with you about this. You know, we've sat and and I've picked your brain about different things, different times, whether it be racial issues or business issues or just stress in general. And, uh, yeah. you know, I always enjoy sharing time with you, sharing a whiskey or whatever. And uh, we may be doing this again. I know it burned a lot of your time, but I, I can't thank you enough for sharing your story. It's a, so unique. It's such a great success story. It's not a story that people get to hear enough. They usually hear the tragic story and then it passes on or they see a success story and that doesn't include such a tragedy. So I think that that your story is is really inspiring and I and I hope that you know people are able to listen to it and have a little empathy for other people that were in similar situations and see what is no possible. Doubt. Definitely see what is possible because you've really made it happen. I'm really, you know, without sending condescending, I'm super proud of you and and I'm I'm certainly proud to be a friend and appreciate your time, brother. No, hey, I appreciate you for having me, and it was great having the conversation with you. So I'll look forward to the next one. All right. We'll call you again soon. All right. As long as they don't look back. Look back now. painted and cool what you learned in school. It's hard work over fact. Freedom. You gotta get free now. Welcome. Welcome to the song. <laughs> Who don't be sitting down. Yep. Happily, do this for those before and after me. Trying to pass the baton forward like I'm happily. Took mine and ran with it, now I'm thinking about the next generation. Give them a platform for progress. Butterfly effect, coming live and direct. Ain't no telling how our decisions will manifest. I ain't crying for help. I can do this on my own, set my bread, build my wealth.